Well, good morning. Good morning. A warm welcome to church this morning. It's lovely, uh, lovely to see you. <laughs> it's lovely to see you all uh, and to gather together to worship uh, the Lord. As we begin, let's come before God and pray. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that we're able to gather together this morning. We thank you that you are here uh, with us by your spirit. And Father, we ask that you, in your kindness and mercy, would minister to each one of us today. Father, we don't know what everyone's week's been like. We don't know what our mornings even have been like. We don't know how, we're, how each other are feeling, but you do. And we thank you, Father, that you are um, both wise and good and loving. And we pray, Father, that this morning you would minister to each one of us in the way that you know that we need. For those of us who need comfort, please comfort us. For those of us who need a rebuke, please rebuke us. For those of us who need uplifted, please lift <coughs> us up. Lord, please do what you want to do in each of us today. And Father, as we sing your praises, as we pray together, as we hear your word read and preached, Father, we ask that you would um, help us to hear you speak to us. Help us to worship you truly in spirit and in truth. Father, let this not be a charade, but let it be real. Father, be with us. Um, and Lord, we also just want to pray for the good alls as well, as we say farewell to them uh, today. Lord, please would you bless them during this service and in the days, weeks, months, and years ahead. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I should have said this is the uh, final service um, where Ewan will be here as the pastor's assistant, um, uh, they will hopefully come back and visit us, and uh, Bill said, if we invite you back to preach, I think we will invite him back to preach, um, but uh, this is the, the last time we'll preach here as, as pastor's assistant, and so this service is uh, it's just a normal service, but as part of it we will be um, just saying farewell to them and praying for them as they move on to Larbert. Um, as we uh, will now stand and sing together. Uh, hear the call of the kingdom. We'll stand as the music starts. notices um, for today and for the coming week. Um, first of all, for today, after the service, there's a... I'm still booming a wee bit, George, I don't it's know. On, it's on next door. It's on next door. I'll just shut this door, would that be... Do you know how to turn it off, Excellent. 
Um, no. Uh, thanks. <laughs> she did smile at me before she slammed it in my face, which was nice. Um, uh, just a few notices. So the, the first thing is, uh, after the service, there's going to be a lunch uh, next door. Um, if you're able to stay, then please do. It'll be a buffet. Go and pick up your food, pick up your tea and coffee in the usual way at the hatch, and then uh, find, a, find a seat if you can. Um, hopefully there'll be enough, enough seats at the tables for us. Um, if you're able to stay, please, please do. And then after that, uh, our trip to Ayr, the last of our summer outings, um, has been moved from 2pm to 3pm because of um, the lunch that we're having. I, I do want you to notice in the notice sheet that the lunch has been termed farewell to the good alls, which I think sounds like a pipe tune. Um, so, so if you're musical, you can maybe write it later and give it to them. Um, do you want to write that, John? Farewell to the good alls. That's enough to go on, isn't it? Um, so then after that, we'll meet at, down at Ayr. Uh, it says... Uh, at the beach, at Air Beach, there's a park along to the left of the front. So if you're going down to the sea and you get to the kind of promenade, the front bit, then turn left. Um, it's near Pirate Peets. It's near uh, a big grassy bit where we'll put up a gazebo. And hopefully uh, you can find us there. Um, if you need a lift, please uh, let me know. Um, and we can sort you out. I think we've got... We've got a wee bit of space that I know of, and also if you're driving and you know you've got space, then please let me know, and uh, we can fit people in. Um, also to say our normal prayer meeting is on at 7.30 on Wednesday, please come along uh, if you're able. Um, also to say, we've got the lunch next door, just to the right of the hatch, there's a, a surprise card that you and Pam will be given later and go, oh! Card, how wonderful. Uh, so you didn't hear any of this? Okay. Um, there's a card there. If everyone could uh, sign their name, write a wee message if you want. Um, a wee message so that everyone can fit on. Don't want anyone taking up the whole thing. And there's also a wee box if you want to give a, a financial gift um, to the good dogs to help them as they set up home in Larva. Um, I'm trying to see. Uh, just on the notice sheet again, church cleaning. Uh, it comes around each month. Uh, it's cleaning team two that are on this week. Um, so if you're on cleaning team two, the names are there on the sheet. Please um, arrange among yourselves a time to come and clean. Um, also the flower prayer calendar, the next one's up on the notice board. Please uh, stick your names up on that if you're able. And then finally, just a wee card from um, Brian and Ruth. It says, to all the family, I York Evangelical Church, thank you for the lovely flowers which we received last week for our Ruby wedding anniversary. <laughs> uh, many thanks to for your love, prayers and support for us as a family down the years. It has meant so much to us, uh, Brian and Ruth. I'll leave that there for us. Okay. Um, let's come before the Lord in, in prayer now. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that we're able to gather together as your people this morning. We thank you that you are with us, um, and we thank you that you, in your kindness, have brought us into relationship with yourself, made us, adopted us as your children uh, through the Lord Jesus. Father, we ask that you would be with us this morning and into the coming week. Father, please help us as a church made up of, of Christians to live in this world as your ambassadors as your servants. And we pray that no matter where we are or what we're doing, whether it's at work or at home, um, whether with our neighbours or at the shops, or whether like the good old's preparing to go to, to Labour. Father, we do uh, just ask that you would help us uh, where we are to serve you faithfully. Father, we, we ask that you would help us, um, as we'll be looking at later on, help us to pay close attention to your word. Father, please help us um, to read the scriptures regularly and with the help of your Holy Spirit to, to know what you are saying to us and to be obedient to it. Father, please uh, help us not to be like the man who looks in a mirror and goes away unchanged. But Father, help us to be like those who, who pay close attention to the scriptures and are changed daily uh, by your Spirit working within us and through it. 
Father, please, um, would you help us as well to proclaim you to the ends of the earth? We ask, Father, that more and more people would know you, know who you are, know what you're like, and want to come to uh, know you as Lord and as Saviour. Father, please, uh, would you be at work in our world, that more and more people would turn from sin, more and more people would turn from going their own way in rebellion against their Creator, and would turn to you, knowing that your way is best, and that they would joyfully uh, follow you and enjoy all of your grace towards them. Father, please be with us in the rest of this service, we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're now going to uh, stand and sing together. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but Ewan has a wee uh, a preference for a cappella psalm singing. Have you, has anyone noticed that normally when he's leading, there's a wee psalm thrown in there? He loves it. Um, so we're going to sing a psalm, Psalm 24, and it's a wee bit of a tricky tune sometimes, and so we're going to sing it with John accompanying us for the first uh, verse and chorus, and then sing uh, the second half a cappella. So just keep going when John stops, is what I'm saying. Okay, let's stand and sing together. said that we sang that because of you and liking Psalms, but we've also been wanting to sing that all the way through Daniel, because did you see that, that theme coming through, that the Lord of hosts and none but he, the King of glory is. He is the Lord over all, King of kings and Lord of lords, um, and we sing his praises and worship him. Um, we're going to uh, now invite, I'm not going to invite you up yet, because I think that would be unkind for uh, Eliza, but in a wee minute we're going to invite the good alls up. Um, to pray for them. Um, I wanted just to, I suppose, to say thanks to you and asked him if he was going to cry today. And um, he said, I don't think so. And I said, I probably will. Um, <laughs> um, but you has been here for four years. I've been here for seven, which means for more than half of the time that I've been here, you has been here. 
Um, and so I think I've been doing quite well, but really Ewan's been holding me up and I, we'll see what happens when he goes. Um, <laughs> but Ewan's been a wonderful uh, help to the church and it's been a privilege for us to see him grow over the time. Um, he's grown in so many different ways. He's grown in his preaching, which we've really, really... <laughs> You watch her mouth. She's laughing at you. I don't think it's nice. Um, but he's grown in so many different ways. And um, he's grown in, in his preaching. We've really appreciated seeing that, that gift that we could see. I don't know if you guys can remember. I don't even know how many of you would have been here. Before you and came, he came uh, one Sunday evening to preach. And he preached. Do you remember this? And he, he preached on the... The... the um, story where Jesus is speaking to James and John about what kind of leadership and then there's the blind Bartimaeus who is that right? The blind man? I don't know. And, it, and I can still remember that sermon and thinking this boy can preach. There was loads of rough edges and there was loads of uh, different things that I thought oh, maybe could have done that, I could have said this but the, the gift that God had given was there and it's been beautiful to see that honed and, and grown by, by God through his time here. Um, other stuff though that you don't see, Ewan has been a wonderful help um, in loads of uh, other ways, he's very, very good at thinking of systems uh, and thinking, oh, this could work if we do this. He's also exceptional at laying out chairs. <laughs> <laughs> it's not listed as a spiritual gift in the Bible, but, but you've definitely been gifted in that way. He, he can just look at a room and go, no, Greg, I know that you've just spent half an hour laying this out, but it'd be much better if you just leave me alone for 15 minutes and I'll sort it. And he does. And I've told him... <laughs> I, I'm going to actually ask him to come back from Larbert occasionally just to, to sort the chairs. Um, <laughs> but he's got lots of many, many gifts, and it's been wonderful to have uh, Pamela and then also to welcome Eliza Hall. Uh, they've, been, they've been here as well, and just having you as part of the fellowship and the different things that you've done and the joy that you've brought uh, is wonderful. So it's been amazing, uh, and we're really thankful for you. Can I ask you to come up and we'll um, pray for you? I did ask Phil to come up earlier on, he's not just taking it upon himself. That's a wee gift for you guys. Do you want to say anything? No, just thank you so much for having me for the past four years. It's been a real joy and privilege to be a part of this church family. Um, yeah, it's been wonderful being here. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> 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 I meant to say as well, you and, was, you and Pamela arrived just six months before COVID, which was an immensely difficult time to move, to get married, move city, uh, move into a new church, a new place where they didn't know anybody, and then to try and settle in here, and then uh, on top of that they decided to get a dog, a big dog, uh, and then have a wonderful Eliza as well, so they've been through, had a lot, and uh, it's been amazing to have this part of the church. Let's uh, pray for the good olds. Um, I think you'll all know, so, or many of you will know, they're preparing to go to Larbert. It starts in a month. Um, I don't know, do you want to share any prayer points? Uh, I think the big prayer points as we head off to Larbert, um, we've managed to sell our house, which has been great. Uh, pray that we would find a house now in Larbert, um, otherwise we're going to hit a significant problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, just praying for when we get there that we would settle in quickly, make connections, and be able to serve that church well. Um, I'll, I'll lead us off and then uh, Bill will pray. Excellent. Um, Father in heaven, we do thank you so much uh, for the good offs. We thank you for the part that they have had in this uh, local fellowship of your church. We praise you for uh, the way that they have used their gifts. We praise you for the friendship uh, that we have formed and grown uh, and had with them. And Lord, we, we do just want to commit them to you. We want to give thanks for all that you have made them to be. We thank you for the way that they have grown uh, in the past four years. And as we as have the joy and privilege as a church of sending them on to another fellowship uh, to serve them in Larbert. Uh, Lord, we um, say farewell. And we're sad to see them go, um, but we also know that uh, we continue as part of the one body, serving you in the place that you have put us, and we know that we'll see them again soon. 
Uh, so, Father, we, we commit them into your hands. Uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Father, we do thank you for the time that you and the family have been with us. We thank you for the fellowship. We thank you for the love for us as well. And for the time, times when he has been preaching, we have really been blessed by the preaching of your word. And we pray for him now as he moves to Labbert. This is a big step in his life. It's a change of church, a change of area, a change of environment, and a change of people. And we know, Lord, that these combinations sometimes can cause some problems, but we ask you, Lord, to give them that grace. We ask you, Lord, to give them the power of the Holy Spirit to lead and to guide in his new charge. We know, Lord, that to be a minister of your word is a very privileged position. It's a position, Lord, which is close to yourself to lead and to guide your people, to direct and to bless and to ask for blessing. And we do pray for his prayer life as well, as he would be taking all aspects of his work to you in prayer. We thank you for the power of prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you answer prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you lead and guide. And so, Lord, we would ask you in these days as the induction services on the 16th of September, just to bless the family as they take up those new positions. We ask this in and through your holy name, Amen. Oh no. Would you like to come down and present them? I think we've changed them. <laughs> um, the <laughs> sorry, all of. Uh, we're now going to read the scriptures. Is, would anyone like a, a Bible so that they can follow along? If you'd like to just put your hand up, Alistair can can grab some. Oh, and Addy as well. Thank you, Addy. Um, hands up if you'd like a Bible. June would like one. Zion would like one. Uh, Sheila would like one. Anyone else? <coughs> so, Jonathan would like one. Can see your hand there, lads. Sorry. Okay. Um, so Daniel, continuing our series as we've worked through Daniel chapter five. <coughs> if I can find it. It's after Ezekiel, there it is. Um, Daniel chapter 5, it's on page 890 in the Blue Bibles. Um, I'm just reading the whole chapter. You got it, dude? Daniel chapter 5, um, and starting at verse 1. It says there, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze and iron, wood and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. 
the king summoned the enchanters, astrologers and diviners. Then he said to those wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed round his neck and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel and he will tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought before the king and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you and that you have insight, intelligence and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now, I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed round your neck and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Your Majesty, the Most High God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the most high God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them <coughs> anyone he wishes. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honour the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription, this is the inscription that was written on the wall. Many, many, tekel, parson. Here is what those words mean. Many, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. <coughs> Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed round his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Amen. And before Ewan comes to, to preach from that passage, we're going to sing once again uh, a song which picks up that theme of hearing God's word and putting it into practice. Uh, as God speaks, we listen. And we'll stand as the music starts. God speaks. 
we listen, want to hear His word every day. God speaks, we listen, read the Bible, trust and obey. No better way to truly know God, no better way to truly know us, no better way to truly know life. Cause in the Bible we meet Jesus. God speaks, we listen, want to hear His word every day. God speaks, we listen, read the Bible, trust and obey. Read the Bible, trust and Read the Bible, trust and obey. Thing we've ever sung that final wee bit, have we? <laughs> okay, just before Ewan preaches, let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, uh, we do ask that you would help us to be those who read the Bible and by your Holy Spirit hear your voice and that you would help us to trust and obey. Father, as Ewan preaches now, would you speak through him, would you empower him, uh, and would we hear and put into practice? In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I wonder if anybody's ever been in a situation where there was a big sudden warning, right? Uh, some of you that work in maybe technical jobs, you'll get some more serious ones. The one that most of us probably encounter is a fire alarm, right? Anybody ever been in a building where a fire alarm went off? Yeah? Anybody ever been in one where there was actually a fire and it wasn't just like somebody's burnt their toast? Or somebody smoking in the toilet? Yeah? Um, who's got a big loud voice? Greg, what does a fire alarm sound like? Yeah, that kind of thing, right? Uh, our story today is a little bit like a fire alarm. There is this sudden warning. And what we're going to see as we go through this story is the turnaround of what happens is lightning fast. The warning happens and then almost immediately it is fulfilled. Uh, so let me set the scene for you. It is 539 BC and we are in Babylon. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, who we have been dealing with for the past four weeks, he is now dead. And in fact, history would tell us that he's been dead for about 23 years at this point. Uh, Daniel doesn't mention it at all, but between the end of chapter 4 and the start of chapter 5, there is this huge jump in time. Uh, the guy who is now kind of top king is this guy called Nabonidus. He's the king of Babylon, but he has left his son, Belshazzar, in charge. Uh, history would tell us Nabonidus has gone off to do something else not really clear where he is but he's left uh, Belshazzar in charge and he is essentially the king the guy on the throne so that means that he is actually Nebuchadnezzar's grandson the passage does say the son of Nebuchadnezzar but that's just how they use that word son grandson it's kind of the same thing and that has proven to be a really bad decision to leave Belshazzar in charge because what has happened while he is king is that the Persians are now at the gates. So this huge empire, Persia, has been threatening Babylon for ages. They are finally attacked. And as this story takes place, there is an army of Persians at the door. Okay, if you've seen like Lord of the Rings, picture the orcs outside Minas Tirith. Half of you get that. The rest of you are going, what on earth did you just say? <laughs> so we've got the Persians at the gates. Babylon is going to be attacked. And Belshazzar is the one in charge. And what we see is that he goes from being king to being dead in a single night. It is a fall so big that we still talk about it day to day. Uh, there's loads of phrases in English that come from this story. So have you ever talked about somebody as saying that they've been found wanting? That comes from this. Have you ever said of somebody that their days are numbered? That comes from this. And if it gets really bad, you might say of somebody that, ah, the writing's on the wall. That comes from this as well. It is a fall so big that we still talk about it. And so at its heart, this story is a complete tragedy. It is a failure to listen to the warning that has been given. That fire alarm that was blaring, Belshazzar ultimately ignores it. 
and he falls to a, a more powerful kingdom. Ultimately, not just Persia, but the kingdom of God comes and defeats Belshazzar. And so the story starts. Remember, per- Persia is at the gates. Babylon, Belshazzar is in charge of Babylon. And he decides to throw the mother of all parties. Can I get the first slide? And um, Loads of people have painted this chapter. So we're going to just have a few of them up in the back to try and help our imaginations see what is going on. So as we come to the start of this chapter, remember 23 years have passed. We come into it, chapter 5, verse 1. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. I don't know if anybody's ever been at a party with a thousand, a thousand people. It sounds mad, right? <clears throat> um, basically, Belshazzar's got the enemy at the gates and he wants everybody to think he is amazing. Right, he's, he's kind of going, eh, there's an enemy at the gates, but, but you should look at me. I'm amazing. I'm great. History would tell us again that about 10 days before Darius the Mede had defeated the Babylonians in battle. Now they're at the gates. And yet we find that rather than strapping on his armor and defending the city, organizing how his people are going to survive, Belshazzar decides to throw a massive empty. He decides in the face of this oncoming army, the best thing I can do is get the wine out and have a booze up with my mates. It is this last desperate attempt to show power, to deny what is inevitably going to happen. Uh, He's basically drinking to escape what is going on around him. We still see that in our world today. We might have experienced that in our lives. Drinking to escape what is going on around us. That is what Belshazzar is doing. So you can imagine the scene. There's thousands of them there. They are drinking wine. They're getting a bit tipsy. They've called round some girls to make it a proper party. Belshazzar's got all the important people there. And in the midst of this, while he's showing off, he does something that would have horrified any of the Judean exiles that were there. Look with me at verse 2 in the chapter. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. So that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. He takes out these, these conquered holy articles. See, way, way back when, when Belshazzar's grandfather Nebuchadnezzar sacked Jerusalem, he went into the temple, the Holy of Holies, the place where God was symbolized as among his people. And he saw all this golden stuff around him. And Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful king on earth, went, I'll have that. And I'll have that. And I'll have that. And they've been sitting in the Babylonian storehouses. And now as we come to the mother of all parties, Belshazzar goes, let's get out those golden cups. That would be cool, wouldn't it? If, if we drank from the cups that used to be in the temple of Jerusalem. It would be an outrage for the Judeans to see that these holy temple cups were being used for Belshazzar and his mates to get drunk. These cups that had once stood in the temple... That they represented the place of God's presence on earth. It's probably the ones that were used for the drink offering before God. Belshazzar's now using them to drink his wine out of. Maybe he's remembering the glory days when Nebuchadnezzar was all powerful. But it is a complete outrage. And while they are doing that. While they are all sitting around getting drunk. Drinking out of these sacred objects. They start to praise the false gods. Look with me at verse 4 and what happens. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood and stone. And look, you can imagine the scene, can't you? Belshazzar and his friends are all sitting around drinking and somebody goes, Ah, what, shall we praise a god? Somebody goes, yeah, the god of gold. Oh, let's praise the god of gold. And somebody else goes, let's praise the god of silver. Yes, let's all drink to the god of silver. Uh, What about the the god of bronze? Yes, the god of bronze. The god of wood, why not? The god of stone, sure. Let's drink to him. Uh, They are just praising any god they can think of. And through it, absolutely setting themselves up against the one true god. Belshazzar is just completely serving himself. And he thinks at this moment, no, I'm in a good position. Babylon is a strong fortress and and I'll be here forever. So so it's okay for me to drink and have this party and use these holy objects. 
He thinks that he is untouchable and he can do whatever he likes. And that is a, a word that our world loves, isn't it? We love to think that we are untouchable. That we can do whatever we want and no consequences will ever come back on us. That is what Belshazzar thinks. And he is lifting himself up as much as possible. As he throws this enormous feast for everybody. But that celebration is brought crashing down in a moment. Next slide. Uh, it is one of the most famous scenes in the Bible. I just want you to imagine what is going on. So remember the scene. You've got Belshazzar throwing his party, drinking his wine. They're praising any and every god they can think of. Suddenly, verse 5. Will read with me. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. As they're throwing this party, suddenly, somehow, fingers appear in the air and they write these words on the wall. They do it near the lampstand so that everybody can see. And Belshazzar responds like a cartoon, right? He's standing there, he watches this writing appear on the wall, and suddenly his face completely drains of colour. Uh, you can imagine suddenly he's biting his nails like that. And his knees start knocking together. That's what we're told, right? That's Belshazzar, as this writing appears on the wall. He is quaking with fear. And, and they see this writing appear, but, but nobody can read it. Look at what happens next in verse 7. The king summoned the enchanters, astrologers and diviners. He said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. See, he desperately wants to know what this means. And so he calls in all the clever people he can get. He says, come and have a look at this. And if you can read it, if you can tell me what it means, then I'll give you glory and power and riches. I'll give you a nice purple cloak. I'll give you a big golden chain to wear so everybody knows how important you are. I'll make you the third highest ruler after my dad and after me. Then it'll be you. You'll be top dog. If you can just tell me what that writing says on the wall. But nobody can answer. He's got all of the cleverest people in the kingdom there, but not one of them can tell him what that writing actually says. This mysterious writing that seemingly appeared out of nowhere. Uh, now, this might be sounding pretty similar to a story that we did a few weeks ago. If you remember, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king two before, he had had a dream that nobody could understand. And like Belshazzar, he had gotten all the important people, all the clever people, and none of them could tell him. It's the same kind of thing happening again. The king wants to know, but he can't find the answers with all his power. Well, I think somebody in the palace remembers what had happened before with Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Uh, because look what happens as this is happening. We'll start with verse 9. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. Everybody's going, what, what does the writing mean? Why, how can we know? And then verse 10, the queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding, and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. So it might be that this is Belshazzar's wife, or the word queen might also mean kind of his dad's wife. So it could just be an older royal in the family, who remembers what happened when Nebuchadnezzar had that dream that nobody could understand. It's worth noting that by this point, it's been about 70 years since Daniel was deported. 
since he got taken off in chains from Jerusalem as a teenager. Uh, so he is now a man in his 80s. Is there anybody here in their 80s? Yeah? Any men? Hey, but you're the man in your 80s. No, George as well. Um, so like, think of Hamish, right? Hamish is kind of what Daniel would have looked like, okay? Uh, so he is now a man in his 80s who has spent a lifetime in exile in Babylon. And it was even a lifetime ago that Daniel interpreted the dream. There can't have been that many people in the palace who remember 60 odd years ago when Nebuchadnezzar had his dream. Daniel's got to have been a, a bit of a legend, right? Like a story that people tell about something that happened ages ago. Um, but they know Daniel was able to interpret the dream. Maybe he can read the writing nobody else can read. Um, so we know the party was happening late at night. Hamish and George, where are you normally at about 11 o'clock at night? In bed, right? I imagine they got Daniel out of bed for this. I, I can't imagine that a man in his 80s was up. I think they went and knocked on his door and Daniel went, ah, what? <laughs> Writing on the wall. Wait, God, let's go down. Uh, so they bring him out, right? They bring out this old man and they say, can you read that? Uh, look at what they promise again. So Daniel was brought out before the king and the king said to him, Daniel, one of the, are you one of the exiles my father the king brought out of Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you and that you have insight, intelligence and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. He says, Daniel, please help me. I think you might be able to. And then he says, if you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck. And you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. It's the same offer again, right? Daniel, if you can tell me what this means, I'll put a gold cloak on your shoulders. I'll put a big fancy gold chain around your neck so everybody knows how important you are. And I'll make you the third highest ruler in the land after me and after my dad. You will be the top dog if you can just tell me what that says. And it's amazing, isn't it? Look at verse 17. Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your reward to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Uh, Daniel basically goes, No, mate, you can keep your gifts. I'm not interested. Uh, you can keep your dress-up clothes and your fancy jewellery. It's no good to me. But I'll tell you what you ask anyway. I think this is probably because Daniel knows that Persia is going to be in charge in the morning. And so nothing Belshazzar gives him is going to be worth anything for more than six hours. But he's still willing to tell the king in what becomes the, the final statement to them. Can I get the next slide? So Daniel speaks and... Did you see in the story that he doesn't read it at first, right? He doesn't immediately go, this is what it says on the wall. No, Daniel starts by telling Belshazzar how he has failed, right? He says, I'll tell you, but first I've got some stuff to get off my chest. I'll tell you what it says, Belshazzar, but first of all, I'm going to let you know what I really think. Um, and it is ultimately summed up in verse 22. You take a look down with me at what he says there. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. His criticism of Belshazzar basically comes down to, you knew everything I'm going to tell you, but for some reason you did not humble yourself. Your heart was hard. You chose to ignore it. I mean, he starts by telling him what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He reminds him of that amazing story. He tells him how Nebuchadnezzar had been great and powerful and everybody feared him. He could do what he wanted. But then he tells him how when Nebuchadnezzar became too powerful, God brought him low. If you were here last week, do you, do you remember Greg throwing Alistair off the stage? That sounds really bad if you weren't here. But if you were here, you'll remember that that was a picture of Nebuchadnezzar always trying to get to the higher throne and God having to go, no, you stay in your place. Until eventually God threw him right down so that Nebuchadnezzar was made like, like a donkey, like a wild animal. 
He was utterly humiliated, all his glory and power taken away until Nebuchadnezzar turned away from himself, turned away from his sin, from his pagan gods, and turned to serve the true God. Let's just remember what he said at the end of chapter 4. If you've got your Bible, look with me at verse 36. So this is where Nebuchadnezzar's story ended in Daniel. At that time, my sanity was restored. My honour and splendour were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and I became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride he is able to humble. That is how Nebuchadnezzar ends, recognising that God is the one in charge, that God is ultimately the one who is on the throne. That is the legacy Nebuchadnezzar left for his descendants. Ultimately, Nebuchadnezzar was humbled before God, and ultimately God saved him. As Nebuchadnezzar turned to God, God was delighted to show mercy on that man. Daniel tells him all this, but you, Belteshazzar, verse 22, his son, have not humbled yourself. Though you knew all this. Belshazzar, you knew what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. You knew what God does to proud kings. But you've still chosen to have a party where you drank out of the holy goblets. You've still chosen to completely disregard the true God of heaven. And so that is why for you, the writing is on the wall. He has chosen to be blind of his grandfather's faith. Chosen to ignore the past. Chosen to bow before these false gods of iron and gold and wood and stone. And that is why God sent the inscription. And Daniel alone is the one who is able to read what is written on the wall. Look with me at verse 25. This is the inscription that was written, Daniel says. Many, many, tekel, parson. Now I imagine that meant about as much to Nebuchadnezzar as it does to us today. Right? If I just told you those words in the street, you would look at me like there was something wrong with me. But Daniel goes on to explain how these words point to what will happen. Verse 26. Here is what these words mean. Many. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez. Which is the same as Parson. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And that is a picture of what God will do. It's a warning that that night Belshazzar the king will be thrown out. Taken off his throne and killed. And that within hours a new empire is going to sweep to power over Babylon. Persia. By the time the first light hits the city in the morning there will be a new king. In Babylon. That is a sobering warning, right? That should be a ringing siren in Belshazzar's ears of what is coming. This is it for Babylon. Game over. You've had your chance. You've wasted it. Now time is up. But Belshazzar simply doesn't take it seriously. Look at verse 29. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck. And he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. It's as if he hasn't heard what has just gone on. He's gone, oh, I'm so worried about the reading. I'm so worried about what it says. Oh, here's Daniel. Right, Daniel's told me that I'm going to be taken off my throne and Persia's going to be in control in the morning. Great, well, give Daniel the golden cloak and the chain and make him the third highest ruler. Brilliant, we know what's going on now, guys. Fantastic. There's no sense that he repents, right? There's no sense that he goes, oh, I have messed up. I have made a real mess of things. Instead, he just rewards Daniel. Even though Daniel said earlier, you can keep your gifts, they're no good to me. The words of God just don't impact him at all. And it seems like almost straight away he would have gone right back to showing off. To drinking out of his golden cup. At Daniel instead, I imagine, as a man in his 80s, 
tell me if I'm wrong, would have gone back to bed. It's very late at night now. He said what he wanted to say. I'll go and get some sleep, thank you. See, with Belshazzar, the, the supernatural, the writing on the wall terrified him. He couldn't stand it. Remember, his knees were knocking, his face weren't pale, and he was doing the cartoon scared thing, right? But when he actually gets the words of God, the truth, this warning about what will happen, he doesn't seem bothered. He kind of goes, right, well, now I know what the writing is. That's fine. But we know from the end of the story that that night he faces the consequences. Look with me at verse 30. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. No idea why we're told he was 62. Just interesting. But he faces the consequences. His days had been numbered. He was found wanting on the scales. And so Persia came to take away his kingdom. And we can imagine that at some point that night, the party that Belshazzar was throwing would have turned to violence as Persian soldiers came in. As Belshazzar was overthrown and the new king set up in his place. Belshazzar ignored the warning that was given and so he was crushed for his rebellion against God. Next slide. So this chapter then, it should be a warning to us. There is a terrible warning for us in these words that we all stand like guilty Belshazzar. Because like guilty Belshazzar, all of our days have been numbered. None of us truly know when we will die. But we know it is coming. None of us truly know when or how we will meet our end. But we know that God has set it already. Our days are numbered. Many. And like Belshazzar, we will be weighed on God's scales and ultimately found wanting. We will be weighed against God's perfect, holy purity. And we will be found that our lives do not meet that standard. That should be the truth that makes us quake like Belshazzar. Right? That truth should make the colour drain from our faces and our knees knock together. As we think about the reality of being found wanting on God's scales. And ultimately, like Belshazzar, we need the word of God to tell us this. And we need to avoid falling into that same trap of ignoring what God's word so plainly tells us. Belshazzar had this word. He knew what God was saying to him. He had it explained by Daniel. And then he just went blindly on the path he was already following. The real tragedy in this story is that he didn't listen to the warning. And so we need to hear that warning. That like Belshazzar, we have all been found wanting. And we face that same decision to ignore the warning, to carry on with the way we are doing things, or to turn to the one who can save us. There is a glimpse of hope in this chapter in the reminder of what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar clung to the hope that God could forgive. And that is the same hope that we can have today in Jesus. That hope that the judgment for our sin must fall, but that Jesus says that he can take that punishment for us. That the penalty for our being found wanting must come upon somebody But Jesus says that he can do it in our place. He says that at the cross, the way has been made for us to be forgiven. And so we don't have to end up like Belshazzar. We don't have to remain in the darkness. The question we've been asking all the way through Daniel, who is on the throne? Belshazzar came to realize that it was not him. It wasn't even Darius. It is God who is on the throne. And that is the same challenge that comes down to us. Will we blindly ignore what God's word tells us? Or will we listen and turn to the one who can save? You see, the the free offer of the gospel, it comes with a warning, doesn't it? It comes with a warning that we are all living in disobedience to him. 
And so we can choose to ignore what has been said and face those consequences. Or we can trust in the one who can save. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story and for the warning it gives us. Father, we thank you that in your love you tell us the difficult truths that we might not want to hear, but that you know we need to hear. Father, we're sorry for all the ways in which we do ignore your words. But we thank you that you have poured out your mercy, that you are not just a God of warning, but a God of grace. Father, we thank you for Jesus and for the offer that is there, that though our days are numbered and we have been found wanting, he will take that punishment for us. Father, thank you for all the truth that is in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to finish by singing a song that we've been learning over the past couple of weeks, uh, Ancient of Days. And it's just such a good song to sing because it picks up on this language of Daniel and helps us to celebrate the amazing truths at the heart of this book. Uh, So we'll stand as the music starts and sing together, Ancient of Days.
We'll finish with these words from 1 Peter chapter 5. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen.